this ceramic model of the universe originated in cultures where the form of government was monarchical and where therefore the maker of the universe was conceived also at the same time in the image of the king of the universe king of kings lord of lords the only ruler of princes who dost from thy throne behold all dwellers upon earth I'm quoting the book of common prayer and so all those people who are oriented to the universe in that way feel related to basic reality as a subject to a king and so they are on very very humble terms in relation to whatever it is that works all this thing I find it odd in the United States that people who are citizens of a republic have a monarchical theory of the universe because we are carrying over from the very ancient Near Eastern cultures the notion that the Lord of the universe must be respected in a certain way people kneel people bow people prostrate themselves because the and you know what the reason for all that is that nobody is more frightened of everybody else than a tyrant he sits with his back to the wall and his guards on either side of him and he has you face downwards on the ground because you can't use weapons that way when you come into his presence you don't stand up and face him because you might attack and he has reason to fear that you might because he's ruling you all and the man who rules you all is the biggest crook in the bunch because he's the one who succeeded in crime the other people are pushed aside because they the criminals the people we lock up in jail are simply the people who, who didn't make it <laughs> so naturally uh, the real boss sits with his back to the wall and his henchmen on either side of him and so when you design a church what does it look like Catholic Church with the altar as it used to be it's changing now because the Catholic religion is changing but the Catholic Church has the altar with its back to the wall at the east end of the church <laughs> and uh, there uh, the altar is the throne and the priest is the chief vizier of the court and he is making obeisance to the throne in front but there is the throne of God the altar and uh, all the people are facing it and kneeling down <coughs> and a great Catholic cathedral is called a basilica from the Greek basileus which means king so a basilica is the house of a king and the ritual of the Catholic Church is based on the court rituals of Byzantium a Protestant church is a little different but basically the same the furniture of a Protestant church is based on a judicial courthouse the pulpit the judge in an American court wears a black robe he wears exactly the same dress as a Protestant minister and everybody sits in these boxes like there's a jury box there's a box for the judge there's a box for this the box for that and those are the pews in an ordinary kind of colonial type Protestant church so both these uh, kinds of churches which have an autocratic view of the nature of the universe decorate themselves are architecturally constructed in accordance with political images of the universe one is the king and the other is the judge your honor there's sense in this uh, when in court you have to refer to the judge as your honor it stops the people engaged in litigation from losing their tempers and getting rude there's, there's a certain sense to that but when you want to apply that image to the universe itself to the very nature of life it has limitations for one thing the idea of a difference between matter and spirit this idea doesn't work anymore long long ago physicists stopped asking the question what is matter 
they began that way. They wanted to know what is the fundamental substance of the world. And the more they asked that question, the more they realized they couldn't answer it. Because if you're going to say what matter is, you've got to describe it in terms of behavior. And that is to say in terms of form, in terms of pattern. You tell what it does. You describe the smallest shapes of it that you can see. Atoms, electrons, protons, mesons, all sorts of sub-nuclear particles. But you never, never arrive at the basic stuff. Because there isn't any. What happens is this. Stuff is a word for the world as it looks when our eyes are out of focus. Fuzzy. Stuff, the idea of stuff is that it's undifferentiated. It's some kind of a goo. Hmm? And when your eyes are not in sharp focus, everything looks fuzzy. When you get your eyes into focus, you see a form, you see a pattern. And so all that we can talk about is patterns. So the picture of the world in the most sophisticated physics of today is not formed stuff, potted clay, but pattern. A self-moving, self-designing pattern. A dance. And we haven't yet, our common sense as individuals hasn't yet caught up with this. So the picture of the world in the most sophisticated physics of today is not formed stuff, potted clay, but pattern. A self-moving, self-designing pattern. A dance. And we haven't yet, our common sense as individuals hasn't yet caught up with this. Well now, in the course of time, in the evolution of Western thought, the ceramic image of the world ran into trouble and changed into what I call the fully automatic model or image of the world. In other words, Western science was based on the idea that there are laws of nature. And it got that idea from Judaism and Christianity and Islam. That, in other words, the potter, the maker of the world, in the beginning of things, laid down the laws. And the, the law of God, which is also the law of nature, is called the Logos. And uh, in Christianity, the Logos is the second person of the Trinity, incarnate as Jesus Christ, who thereby is the perfect exemplar of the divine law. So we have tended to think of all natural phenomena as responding to laws, as if, in other words, the laws of the world were like the rails on which a streetcar or a tram or a train runs, and these things exist in a certain way, and all events respond to these laws. You know that limerick, there was a young man who said, Damn, for it certainly seems that I am a creature that moves in determinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's this idea that there's a kind of a plan, and everything responds and obeys that plan. Well, in the 18th century, Western intellectuals began to suspect this idea. And what they suspected is whether there is a lawmaker, whether there is an architect of the universe. And they found out, or they reasoned, that you don't have to suppose that there is. Why? Because the hypothesis of God does not help us to make any predictions.
In other words, let's put it this way. If the business of science is to make predictions about what's going to happen, science is essentially prophecy. What's going to happen? By studying the behavior of the past and describing it carefully, we can make predictions about what's going to happen in the future. That's really the whole of science. And to do this, and to make successful predictions, you do not need God as a hypothesis, because it makes no difference to anything. If you say everything is controlled by God, everything is governed by God, that doesn't make any difference to your prediction of what's going to happen. And so what they did was simply drop that hypothesis. But they kept the hypothesis of law. Because if you can predict, if you can study the past and describe how things have behaved, and you've got some regularities in the behavior of the universe, you call that law. Although it may not be law in the ordinary sense of the word, it's simply regularity. And so they, what they did was they got rid of the lawmaker and kept the law. And so they conceived the universe in terms of a mechanism. Something, in other words, that is functioning according to regular clock-like mechanical principles. Newton's whole image of the world is based on billiards. The atoms are billiard balls, and they bang each other around. And so your behavior, you, every, every individual therefore is defined as a very, very complex arrangement of billiard balls, being banged around by everything else. And so behind the fully automatic model of the universe is the notion that reality itself is, to use the favorite term of 19th century scientists, blind energy. In, say, the metaphysics of Ernst Haeckel and T. H. Huxley, the world is basically nothing but blind, unintelligent force. And likewise, in parallel to this, in the philosophy of Freud, the basic psychological energy is libido, which is blind lust. And it is only a fluke, it is only as a result of uh, pure chances that resulting from the exuberance of this energy, there are people with values, with reason, with languages, with cultures, and with love. Just a fluke. Like, you know, 1,000 monkeys typing 1,000 typewriters for a million years will eventually type the Encyclopedia Britannica. And, of course, the moment they stop typing the Encyclopedia Britannica, they will relapse into nonsense. And so, in order that that shall not happen, because you and I are flukes in this cosmos, and we like our way of life, we like being human, if we want to keep it, say these people, we've got to fight nature because it'll turn us back into nonsense the moment we let it. And so we've got to impose our will upon this world as if we were something completely alien to it from outside. And so we get a culture based on the idea of the war between man and nature. And we talk about the conquest of space, the conquest of Everest, and the great symbols of our culture are the rocket and the bulldozer. The rocket, you know, compensation for the sexually inadequate male. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to conquer space. You know, we're in space already, way out. If anybody cared to be sensitive and let what's outside space come to you, you can if your eyes are clear enough aided by telescopes, aided by uh, radio astronomy, aided by all the kind of sensitive instruments we can devise. We are as far out in space as we're ever going to get. But, uh, you know, sensitivity isn't the pitch. In, in the, especially in the WASP culture of the United States, we define manliness in terms of aggression. You see, because we are not, we're a little bit frightened as to whether we are really men. And so we put on this great show of being 
a tough guy. Uh, it's completely unnecessary. Uh, it, it, you know, if you have what it takes, you don't need to put on that show. You don't need to beat nature into submission. Why be hostile to nature? Because after all, you are a symptom of nature. You, as a human being, you grow out of this physical universe in just exactly the same way that an apple grows off an apple tree. So let's say the tree which grows apples is a tree which apples, using apple as a verb. And a world in which human beings arrive is a world that peoples. And so the existence of people is symptomatic of the kind of universe we live in. Just as spots on somebody's skin are symptomatic of chickenpox. But we have been brought up by reason of our two great myths, the ceramic and the fully automatic. Not to feel that we belong in the world. So our popular speech reflects it. We say, I came into this world. You didn't. You came out of it. We say, face facts. We talk about encounters with reality. As if it was a head-on meeting of completely alien agencies. And the average person has the sensation that he is a somewhat that exists inside a bag of skin. A center of consciousness which looks out at this thing and what the hell is it going to do to me? You see? Uh, I recognize you. You kind of look like me and uh, I've seen myself in a mirror. And uh, y you look like you might be people. <laughs> so maybe you're intelligent. Maybe you can love too. And uh, maybe perhaps you're all right. Some of you are anyway. If you you've got the right color of skin or you have the right religion or whatever it is, you're okay. But there are all those people over in Asia. Africa. And they may not really be people. When you want to destroy someone, you always define them as unpeople. Not really human. Monkeys may be, idiots may be, machines may be, but not people. But we have this hostility to the external world because of the superstition, the myth, the absolutely unfounded theory that you yourself exist only inside your skin. Now, I want to propose another idea altogether. 